celebrated the 45th anniversary birthday of hip hop. Um, and all of you, you know, you guys were birthed in hip hop. I'm curious as to what was the first brand in hip hop fashion wise that you fell in love with, aside from your own? And, <laughs> and which one um, are you in love with now? Yeah. Let's, let's go ladies first. So it was Willie Smith for me. Willie Ware, who remembers Willie Ware? <laughs> Span around. And now I would have to go with Walker Ware. We relaunched. Of course you have to go with Walker. I said aside from your own. Um, uh, Andy. Uh, I saw a video of Heavy D and the boys, and they all wore Coca-Cola clothes, which uh, was a line in the 80s. Absolutely. My brother designed it simultaneous when he first did Hill Figure, but uh, they were the first hip hop video wearing cool gear. And Absolutely. that's back now with Kiss. And, and, and heavy, heavy had moves too. So that was, oh, that was good. Oh, heavy had moves, yeah. <laughs> Dame, first brand fell in love with. I think, you know, I, I, I saw a profit in Fat Farm because, you know, when Russell did something, I felt like I could. Absolutely. So, you know, once I saw Fat Farm, I was like, I can get into this business. But what made me really get into the business was Iceberg. But I don't know if you consider that an urban brand because it was made by Italians, but urban people wore it. You know Absolutely. Because it's Coca-Cola, who was that made by? Coca-Cola. <laughs> yep. Bajani. Bajani? Yeah. So would you consider that an urban the brand? Was that a hip hop brand? I'm asking you. No. no. All right, moving on down. Carl. What was the question? See? Uh, no, um, for your, the first brand you fell in love with, and what brand are you feeling right now, aside from your own on both sides? Well, the brand that we grew up wearing probably was Guess. In high school, we all grew up wearing Guess, and like we all wanted to uh, emulate those type of denim jeans that we're wearing. And that was inspired me to want to kind of do my own thing. I felt like the cuts on the jean didn't really fit the way we wanted to do. And in terms of brands today that I respect, I like Y3. I think Yoshi Jimoto line is dope, and I like the quality level that he's doing, and I feel like it's transcending the moments right now. Brilliant. For me? Uh, <laughs> yes, you, Maurice. I was waiting for you to say my name. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Maurice. <laughs> uh, for me, the, that's the first brand that I remember that I had on my uh, basement wall was uh, Patrick Kelly and Jane. Jean Paul Gaultier, and uh, I wanted to be like, when I started doing our urban, I wanted to be like the hip hop version of Jean Paul Gaultier. Yeah. Oh, and Peter? From the 90s, I, I mean, in the brands I like now, right. everything from the 90s. <laughs> All right. so, yeah, so the, uh, so, so the brands that we were really into, because I came from the dance culture, and it was uh, United, United Colors, the Benetton, it was Coca-Cola and Converse. I mean, it was a head-to-toe experience. I mean, if, if I was on the dance floor, you had to see me. So those were the best representations. Coca-Cola surprisingly popped up a lot. <laughs> um, you know, a, 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 which leads me to a thought as far as like brands aligning themselves with culture. And I know, as opposed to what you guys built from the ground up, and I know with your brother sort of like being that f an entry point and aligning with the culture in some ways, what was that like versus, you know, building something from the ground up? Well, once the musicians and rappers started uh, wearing the clothes and mentioning Tommy in the songs, we were just like, wow, this is fucking great. Because we're musicians first. My brothers and I were musicians and still are. And uh, once we heard Graham Pooba say, Jerbo hanging baggy hill figure on top, Tommy and I looked at each other and we were like, holy shit, this is hot. So. Great. You can pass it down. Um, April, same, you know, same sort of thing. I guess as, as being a pioneer and also being a woman, um, what was that experience like as building something for the culture? And the one thing that kind of really struck me in, when I, you know, and just looking up information about you uh, was heritage. That was an important word. And I think from the 90s till now, like what does heritage mean to you and what did it mean to you back you know, in, in the 90s? So I think it's always been more about culture like when I first started I was doing it because I loved it and it morphed into a business but I think because I loved it so much and was so passionate about it and really was hip-hop it was always about building legacy so that's how that word heritage 
comes into play because I always wanted to own my own brand and I didn't see it, see it as an overnight thing. And Dame, did, did the idea of Heritage pop up, you know, it, it, as far as like your beginnings in the fashion space or was it just kind of like starting where you are? I mean, in the beginning, it was really just, we thought we was fresh, you know, so it was like everything everybody was wearing, it was almost like they was copying us. So it was like, we just make it. But I've always been on a basic tip. You know, I went to boarding school when I was young. So I was always very much uniform and I like being neat. So, you know, I've always been sort of like a classic kind of dude. So I don't know if it's about the heritage. I started to learn more about heritage as I got into the business. I knew about building a brand just because of my experience on the street and making sure that my color top was consistent. But, you know, the heritage thing came a little, the awareness of how important it was came a little more later down the line. Really, being urban and being from the street, we never wanted nothing that was really urban. We always wanted something that was non-urban because if it was urban, that meant everybody could get it. We wanted something that was aspirational and something that nobody could get. That seemed like it was... Don't we all? Well, not really anymore, <laughs> but that's how we looked at it back then. Right. You know what I'm saying? It was like aspiration came from stuff that wasn't in the hood. You know what I'm saying? That's why I thought he had a, they had a tough time when they started to key in on Absolutely. urban. And, you know, when Grand Poobah was in the ad, I thought that might have been the death in the moment for uh, Tommy Hilfinger because then it was accessible to urban. You know what right. I mean? Carl, Carl, so, I mean, you, Damien said something really interesting was the idea of aspirational. Um, is that a word that you associated with, with the beginnings of Carl Kanai? Like, what, what was the thesis, you know, at, at the early generational phase? Yeah, I think, you know, when we first started, um, we was all young and innocent, <laughs> and we just took the knowledge that we got from working on the streets and applied that into the fashion world. We knew what we wanted to wear, but those type of clothing wasn't in the stores. So as opposed to complaining about it, we wanted to go out there and change the game and make our own clothing. It started with us getting our clothes tailor-made and making people like what we like and taking our energy and spreading it worldwide. And I think the key to the whole thing is like, it shows you what happens when you give a kid from the streets free thought. Free thought, because we didn't know what failure was all about. We just knew what it was to make our own clothing, and we knew we was gonna get the W, we're gonna get this W and win regardless. So it shows you like the power which you have when you come from the inner city to apply your knowledge and spread it worldwide. So that's how I came up with the name Kanai. Kanai was a question I used to ask myself, can I be successful? Can I come from the inner city and establish a brand that's gonna be internationally known? And every day we have to answer that question, yes I can. That's, that's beautifully stated. And I think, you know, there's a lot of East Coast happening right here. <laughs> um, but Detroit, you know, I think especially like there's a different urban grit in Detroit. Like what, you know, at, at the beginning of, of Maurice Malone, what was some of the things that you kind of incorporated into the product and the brand? Well, I originally wanted to be a special effects artist. And uh, the way I design is like, I see things in lines and details and architecture and just, I'm always trying to like make some shit that'll blow your head up and just take things to the next level. So when I started doing clothes, it was out of, uh, I just fell into it. You know, I, I made myself something that other people liked. And when I got to the point, I was like 19 years old and I was making more money than I can make at Burger King. Then I said, you know, this is our right career. And I stuck with it and just went from there, from hats to shirts to jeans and just went from there. That's brilliant. Um, Peter, I, th I think, you know, these guys have all built amazing brands. What does the idea of brand mean to you? Because you, you see a lot of cool labels, logos, looks, but to build a brand is very different. Um, uh, just what's your, what's your take on that? Well, I mean, it, it's interesting. One of the things we're not, we haven't mentioned when you talk 90s is you, you got to relate it to like the clubs and what was going on in New York and the city life and how it related to it becoming a corporate situation because it started in the clubs. It started with, you know, what you had to look like head to toe because, you know, you became that brand, right? So whatever you represented, you were known. So if I walked into a club, Union Square or Latin Quarters or Tunnel or Mars or whatever, 
you knew me from the minute I walked in the, you know, to the door before I even stepped on the dance floor because my head to toe was my representation. Plus, I didn't have a lot of money, so if I was going to talk to a girl and get a number, my representation had to be right because I had no car. I had the A train to take her on after that. So if I looked fly in the club and I was kicking it up, now I was good. I was the brand. And, and it's interesting how when I met Tommy Hilfiger and I met other people and I started modeling, that they, they didn't want me to change up my look. They were like, we love you. I don't have my long dreads now, as you can see. You know, I don't dreads, but I had the long dreads back in the day you in the 90s. You still got to know. You can do a little runway after, you know, yeah, so when, about another small. 20 minutes. But, <laughs> but, but what I loved about our culture is that we didn't, have to, we didn't switch it up. We kept it from where we took it from the clubs to the runway, from the street to the runway, like Carl and, you know, and Tommy and Andy and, you know, and, and April and Rockaway. It was like one of those things that it was like that's what transitioned us into corporate and it made us into those, you know, those celebrity brands that you see now. But you got to remember where they came from. And we're talking 90s. I wanted to at least Absolutely. big up at least the evolution of where it came from. Do you, do you think that that model still exists? And this is for everybody, you know, as far as like where a look or a style may come from. I mean, I look at fashion as sort of Instagram. like the lowest common denominator for self-expression, right? Like you didn't have a car, you didn't have a house, but you like you had a, you had a dope outfit. So where does that sort of emotional intelligence and connection to building a brand come from? And, and is it still the same? You as, can as build a brand now on Instagram. Before it was the magazines, product placement, MTV. Now it's all about social media. I mean, look at these, some of these companies are doing really well because they found their audience on social media. It, in, in fashion, you know, building a brand means you have to be consistent. So that means it can't happen overnight. And building a brand means you have to have a point of view. And you have to be able to articulate your point of view and showcase your point of view in a quick second. And every time you walk around, your lifestyle has to reflect your point of view. So like, I have a black shirt on. There's no big design. I mean, it has a good rise, a good shoulder. I designed it, it's cut and sew. But it's more about my perspective and what it represents, my mentality and you have to be consistent. So to me, there's no such thing as building a brand overnight because it's like an oxymoron. You can't build a brand without consistency. And I think the big problem with urban clothing, the reason why it wasn't so sustainable is because that wasn't what we were actually doing. Right. It wasn't so much about point of view, it was about putting it on celebrity. And we never had like retail, and we never, no, never understood what a lost leader was, like having something expensive that you could diffuse from. Yeah. You know, everything was at a certain price point, and that didn't reflect aspiration. So when I transitioned out of Urban to do fashion with Rachel Roy, what I learned was I got to spend and lose a lot of money so that I could sell something at a cheaper price point mass. The same way there's a Maybach for a Mercedes, probably where it doesn't pay the bills for Mercedes, right. but because you can't afford it, you're going to buy a 300 or a 200 and a lot of it. Yeah. And that's really the fundamental that wasn't established in Urban right then and there was that aspiration it's always important to someone have a designer line and then be able to diffuse from it and you have to be consistent and then also you got to have a, a good pocket because it's hard to grow without going broke well, I, by I yourself think... without a partner and then that's when you have to start giving up control to people that aren't from our culture and then that's when it becomes exploited and then that's when you're not here for a very long time Just to piggyback what Dame is saying, I think in terms of Instagram, brands remain to be seen in terms of longevity because building a brand does take a long time. And I think the difference now is we really did have a lifestyle brand, you know, so we were living it, we were connecting, we were in the streets, we were in the process. And right now, a lot of people are missing the process. It's easy to make a design and put it up on Instagram, but consistency is such an underrated word, and you gotta be in it to win it, and you gotta know those 19 hours that you're gonna work that aren't sexy on Instagram. Are you willing to sign up for that and do that consistently? That's gonna tell whether you br your brand lives or dies. I think consistency is such a, a great point, because especially now, like things evolve so rapidly, and how you know a brand may be built on a certain culture that even that culture evolves. So Carl, I'm, I'll throw this to you because I think about the celebrity alignments, you know, and where brands, especially young brands, may not necessarily have that that celebrity connection to kind of draw the 
the connection to the culture. Um, so how do, how do you bridge the gap between celebrity involvement and just like the hustle and the consistency of, of your, your, the growth of your brand? Well, I could speak about like how the game has changed since back in the days to how things are now. Like back in the days, we used to, you know, place your ads in Vibe and Source magazine and do a couple of billboards and you pretty much were good. And now the fashion game has changed so much where influence is becoming more of your norm for advertising. So this is a game of adjustments now. You gotta adjust to where the business is going because if you get stuck with how things used to be, no one's gonna care. The game is gonna keep on moving. So like with our company, what we've done is to align ourselves with companies who are part of this fast fashion online media company, social media driven online sales. And these companies are doing $1.5 billion in sales just online. So we align ourselves with my homeboy Umar from Pretty Little Thing and we did a collaboration recently and the numbers are just really ridiculous. In two weeks we sold $2 million just online, which the game has changed now. Like retailers are not as important as they used to be back in the day. So we just learned to adjust to where things are going and who knows, it may change back again where people want to go to brick and mortar and touch and feel products, but for right now, Buying online seems to be where the game is at right now, so we gotta adjust our business to go along where things are going. So I'm not fighting against the change, just gotta adjust to the change. The, the bottom line is, if your work is good, then it, it doesn't really matter about the celebrity. They come into you, you just have to be patient. So most real lines that have longevity, they start with a lost leader. They do a designer line, but they lose money doing that. And that's what people don't do. You have to have good work and showcase it at a level that people respect you for fashion. Like, fashion is not just putting a logo on a t-shirt. Again, the point of view has to reflect in the clothing. So it's about your cut, your fit, what it means, the lifestyle. But at the end of the day, you might have to lose some money to showcase your brand. When you get into the business of like, fashion and design the business of the it, business of right, it, like, you know it's the hardest business i've ever been been in because number one you're dependent on other people paying and picking up things that they order and selling it at full price your margin is always terrible and you always need money up front because you have to deliver because you want a calendar so it's almost like success can put you out of business but again my point is if you have a good line a good designer line you usually have to lose money and figure out see in urban business the difference is there's uh, 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 independent chains. Mm -hmm. And independent chains can give you volume, but they give you a better margin. But in fashion, you gotta lose money to get into Bergdorf Goodman, it's one store. You do a million dollars worth of development for just you know, editorial to get in one store, just so you can get in Macy's and then only have a 3% mm -hmm. margin. You understand? Y'all follow me? Or am I, did I go on a yeah. tangent? It's a lot so, of math. I, I, so understanding the game <laughs> and the logic of it, you gotta lose a little to build that brand and if everybody got it, nobody won it, you know? So you can't just give it to everybody overnight because then it gets whacked. So it's almost like you got to preserve your brand a little, take your time, don't get in a situation where you got $4 million worth of orders, you only got a million in the bank, and they're going to sell it off price, and then you can't deliver next. Right. And now, every, you know, everything's, it, that's what happens here. And then you got to give it to somebody that's going to leverage your nuts off, and you don't own your company no more, and then you got to license it, and then it's in Walmart, and now you're done, you cooked. <laughs> and that's what happens all the time. Yeah. Walmart dreams. You know, uh, but it's not Walmart no, 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 dreams because no, the margin sucks. You feel me? Like, absolutely. Looking so, like you have volume doesn't mean you got money in your pocket. Like a lot of people spend a lot of money to look big, but they ain't got no margin. So the bottom line is right now the direct and consumer relationship makes the most sense because you get full margin, you never have to sell nothing off price, and you don't have to sit with inventory. What almost put me out of business in every business is dead stock. People order it, they want to be your man, do the orders, but when it comes time to pick it up, they ain't got no bread and I got to sell that shit for cheaper, just, you know, I got to keep it. Yeah. And then I ain't got no money. Absolutely. That was therapy, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, you can continue, you want to lay down? I'm good, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm going to go to Maurice for a second, because I, I, I think you touched on something again, um, which is this idea of success. Uh, and I'm curious as to all of you, what was the most surprising thing about success? Obviously you want it when you start, to, you know, when you start these brands, but then there's these lessons that come along with it that you don't expect. You know, what was something you encountered that you were like, oh shit, I didn't know this was about to happen? Failure. Uh, <laughs> I haven't been successful. So I can't... Untrue. Joke. I got bad jokes. 
<laughs> no. <laughs> um, this dude, this dude had a Ferrari on the block. Before. <laughs> I don't know. I can't tell those stories. Uh -oh. So let's get right. another question. <laughs> what is it? Pass the mic down there. <laughs> I'm married now. I can't talk about success. What you get from that? I can tell you what I, I, can tell you what I knew it was. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Real quick. When Tommy Hilfiger was trying to buy us for 40 million, remember that? What? Rockware, when y'all was trying to buy us for 40 million, that's when I knew. When we had a multiple, we had EBITDA of 40 million times seven, we was worth like 250. So that's when I knew we were successful when that check was coming. You're not successful unless you got money in the bank and you right. got longevity. Looking successful, that's not successful. That's temporary. That's the shit that makes you look corny later in life. You know right. what I'm saying? Like, you know, temporary success is the most dangerous thing. And that's what this business is about. You have to deal with ups and downs. Like, look how many times we look good, and then we look bad, then we look good. It's a, it's a cycle that comes with it. You know, and it's, it's a, it's a never-ending thing in license, fashion. The, license, the licensing business, you can lose money on your apparel. First of all, product sells product. I don't care, celebrity names. If you've got good product, people will buy it. Product sells product. So if you guys all have lines out there and you got hot product, keep doing what you're doing. Can I say something real quick? It wasn't 40 million, that was my cut. It was 40 times three, so it was uh, four times three. Six times EBITDA. Yeah, you no, know what y'all was gonna buy us for. I was just thinking about my money, but it wasn't. That's okay. That's what I knew. <laughs> well, it wasn't 40 million for Rockwell. I wish he would have bought it, then we could have. Well, your man made an announcement that he wasn't doing Rockwell no more, that he was doing that stock card, so that's why y'all didn't buy it. We went deep. Yeah, wait, all right, Maurice has a... Oh, I just, I just... To say one thing. <laughs> Sorry, because I lost my... But also, you build up your clothing brand. Like Damon says, you're not going to make money on your collection because there's only one Bergdorf and three Barneys or whatever. Right. Like... But uh, licensing. You get your name, but you got to license your name to good partners who know your brand and can live your lifestyle, your fragrance, your underwear, your handbags. When we had Jennifer Lopez, we had 15 licenses. Thank God, because the clothing lost money. So the uh, licensing helped us. But you still gotta have a designer line. Oh, this, we had the designer you line. You have to have something you control if you're gonna give, license your brand out because you don't control it no more. They just wanna make money from it. So when you license your brand out, the danger is this person wants to rent your brand and make as much money as possible. He doesn't give a fuck. He just wants to make as much, and then when you burnt out, he goes to the next one. So you always have to have a, a designer brand. Contract. That, or the contract, but they, who, you got to enforce a contract. Come on, bro. You know how much time they do that shit. They'll put, you know, Tom Nasto shitted on state property. He put that shit in the stores without asking me and shit, and everything went off price. Oh, yeah, and shit like that happened. So, you know... All kind of things can happen when you license, you give up control. But you always have to have a designer line so you can preserve your point of view. You might lose, but you make your money from the licensing because that's passive income. You don't have to put up no money when they give you minimums to get that. And then you, have, you make minimum, you know, you make minimum um, guarantees. But Thank you. You know, they don't tell you all that. Uh, pass the mic down to Peter for a second. Because I, th I think... Oh, yeah, or, one, of the or most, <laughs> one of the most important things that you should keep it over yeah, there. Keep young it. designers, if you get into this business, that you got to know is trademark your brand, own your brand, yeah. keep control of your brand name. When you make deals, make sure you got a good lawyer and watch your back on your paperwork. Make sure the company go out of business, you keep your name, you walk away with your name. And go to your production because the number one thing that when you do a deal with a bigger company, they want to sell as much as they can as fast as they can if the, if the brand name is killed in the process. So if you have control of your name and control of how your product is represented to the market and, 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 and how it's marketed and where, where it sells, where it goes, then you can always control that. But once you give away control, you're, you basically are giving somebody a license to kill your brand. You're gonna make, you can make money on it, and you're gonna make money along the, along the way if you got good paperwork, but don't expect to be around that long, so. So Peter, I, I, you know, I think when you uh, talk about marketing, right, and like how do you actually do a better job, because there's, there's some steps that come before you go into the licensing conversation, business or otherwise, but literally like, getting the product into hands of people and, and becoming a part of the culture. So what is your take on marketing you know, from the 90s in comparison to now? Well, I, it's interesting. I think a lot of the things are kind of transitioning into the same, and it, it's an organic approach. Uh, I think if you come with the, the real belief of like, hey, this is what we stand for with our brand, 
and this, we're gonna stand behind this, and you go all the way through, whether you're, if you're a skate brand, and you come from skate, and you've got real skaters representing your brand, and you know, and no diss to like brands that aren't skater brands that don't have the real skate look, but they're trying it. You gotta be real about it. You know, like I like brands like Huff and you know, and Supreme, and you know, those cats dug deep and you know went with their roots and stuck by it and went all the way through and, and kept it real. So I think when you when you're branding, you're you know when you're going out there and you're talking about our brand is hot, you got to distinguish why it is which are hot. You got to say our niche is this. You know, with Tommy Hilfiger, it was like it was like it was like having Busta Rhymes and Method Man out there, right? It's two amazing rappers, right? So that's Ralph Lauren and Tommy. And and you had to figure out why why what was Tommy going to do different? What we were going to do, you know, me and Andy were like, what are we going to do different? that Ralph's doing. Well, Ralph wasn't paying attention to hip hop culture or pop culture in general. And so we said, that's what we're gonna do. I uh, said, so we're gonna take Tommy and turn it into like a record label almost. And we're gonna deal with everything and all facets of music, but really get involved with it. I mean, like from when, when Lalia was, you know, Aaliyah and Kadata were at Tommy Hilfiger, they came to us and said, you know, I need to do a tube top and this, that, and we would listen and re-strategize and strategize around what their lifestyle and their culture was within no that. And we would pay attention. So when I got there, I was, I was all about the clubs. I was coming out of this whole hip hop thing. I was doing every video you can think of. I was like, yo, Tribe Called Quest should be in Tommy. First cover source I ever got, product placement. I didn't even know what product placement was. I showed up with two garbage bags and like laid it down and said, yo, these guys should be in the clothes. And then you get the cover source and then they, and then you see, you know, Tribe Called Quest, and you're like, if they're wearing it, it's got to be cool. But it kept on going, and, we, and, and it looked like we had a record label at Tommy. So that was our niche. I mean, Carl was doing it early. I mean, Cross Colors was doing it early. But we kind of, when we came on the scene, it was just the timing of with MTV and just the video culture and all that kind of stuff. And we just stepped into, stepped into it hard. I mean, we went all the way, you know, buckets with it. Tommy Jeans, you name it, mixtapes, CDs, launch parties. You know, you know, how can I be down? We went everything you could think of. You know, uh, Fashionably Loud, MTV mm -hmm. Fashionably Loud, you name it. I remember seeing Dame and Jay-Z at Fashionably Loud with our brand, and they were like, yo, you, you, y'all doing it, y'all on stage. Having Wyclef play behind us while we had stuff coming down the runway. We were doing stuff that just wasn't getting done like that on that level at that same, you know, and it was all a timing thing. So, I mean, that's how you, you talk about branding. It's, it's kind of about timing as well and how you put, you know, your all into what it is and stay true to your brand. Now, uh, along the way, a lot of brands have come and gone, like a lot, um, you know, and, but you guys have all managed to evolve and still stay. What, like, what goes into staying power? Uh, Carl, I'll start with you since you got the mic, but yeah. Yeah, I think um, what staying power takes extreme focus and dedication to what you want to do, like, um, Carl and I is something we live for, we die for. Every night we go to bed, we think about it. Every day we wake up, we think about it. I'll tell you a brief story. In 2015, uh, Quavo from the Migos hit me up. He was like, yo, like, we want to bring your brand back. We want to be like what Biggie and Pac was to Carl Kanai. And when Quavo said that to me, I was at the point where I was kind of contemplating about the USA market, about what I wanted to do. And the energy that he put out there to me made me realize how big this was. And it shows you the power of hip hop. It shows you the power of what happens when we stick together and try to make things happen. So Quave was my bro. He helped ignite an ignition in me to make me bring this thing back on the USA market and the big level because we was already doing our thing in the international market. 10 stores in Japan, 25 foreign countries dominating for the last 20 years. But in the USA market, we kind of hit a glitch. We were trying to find our way and how to resurface ourselves back into the USA market. The game has changed. The advertising model has changed. The one thing has not changed is the power of hip hop. Hip hop still controls mentality, what people want to wear, not only here, but international markets. So I feel like if you're able to combine resources and understand the culture has never really changed. It's about just adapting and changing and adjusting your game plan to where the market is right now. And that's what we've done. So I think that influence is very important. Instagram probably is the one of the number one tools of advertising. Like we realize as we post, our sales go up. When we don't post, 
our sales try to take stagnant. So we have to find a mechanism, how to post, what time of day to post, who to post, what influencers to have on your list. Right now we have over 200 influencers on our payroll to kind of promote Carl Kanai. So now instead of putting our money into magazines, we put it into influencers. So the game has changed right now. And I think it's a good thing because it just reignites your, your thinking, your mentality to more focus on this new young generation because everything's about a quick fix. People want in instant gratification in fashion right now. So our game has changed and we're going to adapt to where things are going for the future for sure. And for, for this half of the panel is, you know, is there something that you miss as far as like business tactic or a way to engage and just to be? Because I think when you live in a digital culture, like there's a bit of a disconnect between like, I don't have to see you and look into your eyes to do business. But is there something that you miss from the 90s that you wish was still sort of part of the way this business operates today? So what I wanted to say real quick was, I'm gonna tell you what my model is right now, and it's not very different than what it was before. To me, the best commercial is lifestyle. When somebody cool is in a movie, and when somebody cool is an artist and is wearing it, that's how you sell organically. So for me, it was always, I'll just make the movie, and I'll just make the record, and all my artists will wear the clothes. And while they're doing cool st stuff visually, people will want to buy the clothes. But what's dope about now is I make a movie, I make the clothes, I make the liquor, I make the motor oil, and when you're actually watching it, technology makes it where you can buy it as you're watching it. And then you can get that direct consumer relationship. So my advice to anybody is fuck perception. It's all about margin. So a in, 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 in fashion, it's usually a 10% margin if you're lucky, 3% if you're in Macy's. But if you got direct to consumer, your margin is 60%. So let me just put that in perspective. To make $2 million, you got to generate $20 million. But direct to consumer to make $2 million profit, you only got to make four. And you got to watch out for sales motherfuckers that take everybody's order because they get commission regardless and they sell it off price and then you end up out of business. And that's really what happens in the cycle that I see all the time. I see a new guy say, oh, I'm in a bunch of stores. Not knowing if it sells, they have to pay for it. And that they have to, you know, they have to get more money to make more um, um, product in, in a month's time. And they can't collect. And I've seen it put people out of business time and time again. So just understand, a lot of sales isn't the best thing if it ain't going to sell through, if no one's going to pick it up. Direct to consumer, you don't have to hold inventory. You don't have to hold a lot. You cut the order and you send it out and you get full margin and you make so much more. You might not look big, but you can live to see another day. It's, it's, it's about us being able to do it on our own now without getting to a certain point where you gotta sell the fucking company for cheap because all your bills is late. So every company I had, Rachel Roy, Rockwear, State Property, it all went down to when the lights came out. And there was always that guy right there like, I'm gonna just leverage you until you owe everything and you're, you need to ship and you're gonna ship late and it's gonna ruin your business. So you're gonna give me your whole company and you're only gonna have 10% of it and you're gonna lose control of it. It's about understanding how to incrementally keep control because the win is longevity. It's not that money that comes quick that you spend in two or three days. It's that money when you're 47 and you're sitting by the pool and you don't have to go outside. And that's what you want, and that's what you get passed to your kids. It's about keeping ownership of your brand. It's not rushing to be so big that you gotta lose. It's about keeping control so you ain't gotta keep starting all over again. Cause that's what keeps happening. Everybody starts a brand. Everybody I walk through here worked for like 13 different brands since I last saw them five years ago. <laughs> right or wrong? You see, it's just a rotation. It's cause the same people do the same shit. Period, come out here, sell it, get it off price, burn you out, go to the next brand. Watch out for that. I'm gonna tell you the truth, period. So on the heels of that, I think that for me, I was living the lifestyle. And so now I can take advantage of technology, right? I've always owned my own intellectual properties. I've always been about ownership. And now 
health and wellness is big to me. Like from films to the books that I have to, you know, um, fashion. Everything I do is part of my lifestyle. I'm living in my authentic self and all, everything I create, I look at as what can I create that makes sense, where I can pick up and use technology now and storytell and curate what already exists. I work out every day. So now when you see me with my own cannabis products and my own line talking about health and wellness, you understand that because that's what I do. Right? When I bring out a book called Walker Gems, Get Your Ass Off the Couch, you understand that because that's what I do. And I'm telling you how to do that. When I'm t doing my film projects that tell our stories, you understand that because I live that. So whatever you do, I say chase the vision because the money will follow, but be true to it, be passionate. Don't think it's overnight and build something that counts, that you can believe in because there are gonna be times that you're gonna be the only one that believes in it. That's great. Andy, similarly, authenticity, you know, you are tied to a different genre, right? Yeah. Uh, but you're also a musician yourself. You've been on tour, you've lived a life. How does that translate into your brand and, and what maybe some different nuances that you've experienced along the way? Well, my philosophy has always been, my whole thing's always mixing music with fashion. Before Tommy Hilfiger, we had bands, we had stores, our boutiques called the People's Place. We used to dress music, musicians and wear the clothes on stage. And then I, when I went to work for Tommy, as I told you, we started. So my whole thing's mixing music and fashion, and now I'm doing an, another project with art. We're mixing art and fashion, and we're over here called Artistics. Also, Peter, Paul, and I signed uh, uh, Lala Anthony. We work on Lala's brand. So I've got a few things happening. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, as we look around this room, it's definitely a, an omni-culture, right? The, the, and as we were talking about this earlier. We live in sort of a mashup generation of culture, right? Um, What's changed, right? You talked about being in the club. That was like a very specific you know, moment and anecdote which now, you know, I can pick up a, a shirt from Paris and some pants from Inglewood, and like now I've constructed my own look, my own vibe. So how has culture changed, and that's for anybody, the, and how do you adapt to that? So, so this is another brand I work for uh, with Chris Brown called Black Pyramid. And you, you look at a kid like that who has a following like he has millions of, he's got like that Beyonce thing, but he's, he, he dresses fly, like he, the kid is fly. Like, and he reminds me of us from back in the day. And he implements that into his line. Like he's really about like, yo, I wanna be about this, this, that, and the third. And then he represents it on stage. So I think what, what I've been seeing from the younger designers is that they, they, they remind us of us, but they're kind of like diving into the business and the entrepreneurship quicker and sooner because of the technology that's out there. So I'm, I'm impressed. But then you get a black pyramid that can do 15, 20 mil quick, like in a matter of five years, because of the technology, I gotta say, I gotta pay attention to that. His lifestyle, what he represents, his music, you know, how he looks on stage with it, and then how he transitions that into business and how he takes it. Alala Anthony collection, we launched that exclusively with Lord and Taylor. In a matter of two weeks, like Carl said, we were selling like, it was like five mil, you know what I mean? It was, like, it was crazy numbers, like I didn't get it. And then Nordstrom's calling us, talking about they want that curvy jean, and I was like, Nordstrom's is calling it. I was, it just got crazy. But because Lala uses the technology and transitions and shows you her lifestyle and represents it to that level, and you look, you look at it and go, I believe it. So I think that's the difference between maybe the 90s and now is that it's a quicker pace and that kids can jump into the game quicker, but if they've got all of those things lined up and they, you know, they dot the I's and cross the T's, they can get into the game real and, and make real business. And old, old guys like us on stage, I mean, I gotta, I gotta respect that on some level and I can get behind some of those brands and give them our, our gist of what they need you know, from the old school ways. Because nothing's changed. The marketing, like Dame said, the marketing is still the same. You get a fly kid, he's gonna do what he's gonna do. You're gonna, aspirationally look at that person and say, I need that. I mean, I'm, I'm addicted to that in my damn self. I see something, and I, you know, I see something fly, and I'm gonna be like, yeah, I need that. 
you know, if, you, if, you, if you're doing all the right things, I'm on it. So I think those things still are, still are the same, but I think the business is changing and there's more acceptability to different kinds of, you know, artistry coming into the mix from art to artist to, you know, the collaborative to Art Basel to you name it. There's all these different, you know, music genres and different things that you can flow and become a brand within that. But I ain't gonna lie, artists still lead the pack. I mean, what we were doing back in the day, whether it was Wu-Tang Clan mentioning Tommy in a song yep. or mentioning this, that, and the other, that still affects the culture. Just like Carl was saying with Migos, that's still, that's still a representation of hip hop, which leads the culture. But it's just that now they can take the lead and they don't have to wait to get the deals. They could be the deal makers themselves. Brilliant. Uh, we got time for one more question. Um, and I found a quote, which I like. I'm gonna I'm try, I'm gonna attempt to read. Um, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. That was from uh, C.S. Lewis. So I'm just curious from everybody, you know, what's that one thing that you are looking forward to in the years to come? Whether it's this year or 2020, um, what's the, what's, how's that story gonna shift? Well, the business, this business is always changing every couple years. And with technology, it's changing faster and faster. So it's like you, you never know like the business. You, anybody who says, who, who, who starts out telling you, I know everything because I've been doing this, that's a person that's gonna be out of business pretty soon. Because everything changes and you have to constantly learn, do stuff different, look for to 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 push the envelope on different things and always you know um just you got to keep your ears open keep your eyes open and look for the next thing and keep learning because nothing stays the same i told people uh i started a, a, i have another brand called williamsburg armor company i started that brand in 2012 i had retailers I would walk into their store and ask them if they had a website. So I, I, you know, I, I looked, at, I couldn't find your website. You need to get a website. I would advise them, get a website. Because if, you if you're not online in a couple years, you're not gonna be in business. And a lot of them said, eh, you know, I would, but I don't have time. And I, I can call them now and they won't be open. That's how it is. You have to, to, to always keep your eye open for what's coming and don't think that you know everything. Even if you were successful in something, doing it one way, it's gonna to change tomorrow. That's a guarantee. It's like stay naive, pretty much. It's like I don't know anything. Like that, just like keeping that empty mindset. Carl, same thing. What are you What are you looking forward to around the corner? What are you hoping that happens with with the industry? Yeah, um, I like to deal more reality of where things are. I feel like the one thing you can't buy is history and heritage. You know, money could buy billboards, money could buy influences, money could buy a lot of things. We can't buy history. Money can't buy how streetwear started back in 1889. Money can't buy the kid who came from inner city who had a dream to dress his friends, which changed into dressing the nation. What I love about the market today is that the young generation is very good about doing their research on what's real. And when they do what's real, they understand all the real brands that was around from the 90s that started this whole hip-hop culture. Because a lot of designers today who take from our culture and make it seem as if they created this whole looks because they're mainstream. But with the power of internet and social media, kids could do their research and realize that these are the brands that's on stage right now that started this culture back in the 90s. So we all have to do our job now and come back with collections that's gonna adapt to this new young generation to make things happen. So I think we all are at a very sweet spot right now. It all depends on what we do with it because history can't be replaced. History is real. And that's what we're all about right now. So to me, as a company, we're gonna keep pounding the pavements, continue to do collaborations with companies who are trying to set the trend and advance the culture. We just did a collaboration with this company, Attitudes out of Paris. And you know they sell to Barney, Saks, Demons, all the high-end stores in Europe, throughout. And they came to me. You know why? They wanted to be legitimized in the streetwear market. Yeah. And without Carl Kanai, they could have tried it all they want, but it wouldn't be real. Right. So I think that we all need to embrace what we've got, embrace all the hard work we've put in, and maximize it now because all the attention is on '90s culture. So here we go. 
All right, Dame, same thing. What are you looking forward to? Next well, chapter. what I'm enjoying and what I'm looking forward to is the redefinition of the perception of my brand. So I've spent the last 10 years evolving publicly. You know, at one time it was about get money, no matter who you hurt, no matter who it affects, it's fresh no matter what. No matter whether it was illegal, somebody had to be punished, all of that. And what I've been able to be able to do is invest in myself. And what Poppington means is taste, healthiness, my currency is love, treating your woman well, punishing those that have been punishing my culture, ownership, and also seeing that people are understanding that they could do it on their own. Mm. Understanding that independence and ownership means everything. I feel like there's a shift in perspective where we're gonna be able to take it all back and give it to our kids instead of giving it to them to exploit so they could pay their kids college. We're gonna pay our own and look good doing it. You know what I'm saying? And what I love is that there's longevity in what we represent as far as um, our sensibility and fashion. Right now, classic basic hood is now done at a designer level. And that's what I always wanted for us, because we the freshest. So now you're going to pay $200, $300 for a pair of basketball shorts. You understand? Or you're going to pay $200 or $300 for a blank white t-shirt. But at the end of the day, I'm always going to wear socks that have DDs on them. And if you want, you can buy Culture Vulture the book, and you can know all about my mentality. It's over there with Kenyatta. And I'm not just going to tell you about the problems. I'm going to give you the solutions. And if I fail, I fail publicly. I want y'all to learn from it. And that's what I'm looking forward to, the evolution of our culture and for us to monetize us instead of them. And I think we're in that direction. And that's what I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to, I think we have so many resources in our community, but we don't communicate enough. And I say this often, lateral cooperation creates vertical movement. We are the richest people in the world. If we spent nine cents of every dollar within our own communities, we could employ every man, woman, and child. So I'm looking forward to the consumers who spend $1 trillion a year to start spending some of that in their own community. I'm looking forward to seeing a lot more brands win. But let me say something. Like this right here reminds me in one way of something that happened with music, with iTunes. They didn't pay attention with who moved my cheese. And technology is moving so fast. And if you're not employing technology into your business model, or if you're starting a brand today and thinking about today, you're already late. You need to be thinking about what's happening five years from now when you start a brand today in order to not survive but thrive. So just keep that in mind. And it, that was beautiful. And I, I love that everybody's been talking about technology. You know, and one of the things I've been thinking about, and I could, didn't get a chance to dive into it from a question standpoint, was the technology that goes into the manufacturing process, right? The, you know, the way fabrics are constructed and finding those other, and sustainability, like all these different methodologies of creating the product as well as like marketing it and selling it. So I just wanted to make Everything that note. Everything changes so quick. I'm, you know, looking forward to see what's going to happen next. But I like uh, what these guys were saying. You can't buy heritage, you know, but you can collab with it and you can get your inspiration off of what happened. But, you know, someday we're going to turn around and say these were the best days of our lives too. So and these I'm are the best days of our yeah. What a time to be alive. That's it. Um, so we are, the, like, you got, we're all here because of these people, so give it up for this legendary panel. Like, literally, they are the reason we are here. So one bit, we can't do questions, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, it's good to see you, too. No, we don't have time, sorry. But uh, they'll be around. Dane's got his book. He's got a booth. Um, everybody's here. They're all smiling and, and willing faces to have conversation. So um, thank you one more time. Give it up.